The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Marcel Proust. Chapter 1. Does your life really pass before your eyes right before you die? Or do you really see a bright light that you're supposed to walk towards? Now I'm going to find out. These are the last questions, the burning ones, to which I want to know the answers. I'm not having some existential crisis, so don't get that idea. I'm not insane either. I'm just at a place in my life where I just don't matter much anymore. In fact, I've decided that I've had enough of life, all the way around. I just don't want to go on anymore. I know you're going to think this is stupid by the time you finish reading this, but I wanted to answer this bunch of questions for myself, not for you or anyone else. If you keep reading, you'll eventually understand the reasons behind what I'm doing. Again, I'm not trying to be funny here, because I really want to know the answers. It's not like I'm going to be able to impart that information to anyone if I'm successful in this endeavor. Julie sat cross-legged with her laptop in front of her, perched precariously on the firmest pillow she could find in the five-star hotel she had rented for the night three days ago, during which she had been writing furiously. Her suicide note, at least that was her intention when she started, had gone from one page to dozens, an entire volume of stories and anecdotes about the many times she had been ready to end her life. It really had started out as a short note. Her initial intent was to ask one simple question, but in writing, many others arose. As she typed, her mind began to wander, remembering all those terrible times. As she wrote, though, a strange thing was happening. She was recalling some of the good times, too. She remembered intense conversations and little vignettes from her childhood, arguments with her husband and silly things her daughters did. It was all spinning into a cyclone in her mind, none of it making much sense, and the process was launching her to elation and plunging her into tears. The room service trays and dishes had piled up on the desk and dresser. The food dried onto the plates. The honor bar was nearly empty. Her towels were damp and smelled of mildew, although it didn't matter. She probably would not be taking another shower anyway. In any case, she had hung the Do Not Disturb tag on the door handle, letting housekeeping know she would not be requiring their services. No one knew where she was, not her mother or her husband or her kids. She had left her phone on the charger in the house and the car in the driveway so that no one could track her down. By now, they may even have called the police. Come home, they would have said to her. Why would you want to leave, they would have asked. She wouldn't have had an easy answer. When she thought clearly about her situation, she was quite aware that she had an easy life, a good life. She lived in a beautiful four-bedroom pool home in the posh Emerald Hills section of Hollywood, Florida, and was married to a prominent physician. Her children, two girls, were grown and had solid careers and strong marriages. She had friends, or at least she always thought they were friends. They were all people she knew from work, or temple, or the country club. She had been a reporter for a local television station, active in the sisterhood at the temple and chair of the women's division at the club. Even her 86-year-old mother was still around and in good health. Some would call that a double-edged sword, with her mom came the blessings of longevity, of companionship, and the love of family. But it also came with the obligatory Jewish guilt. But Julie wasn't thinking clearly. Her real problem, and it was a significant one, was that she had lived her whole life inside her head in a whirlpool of anxiety and depression. She was self-absorbed and selfish, according to her daughters. Her husband often told her she worried too much. When she was quiet, her husband would get frustrated, knowing she was sinking into that abyss where she couldn't be either reached or reasoned with. He would ask her what she was thinking about, and when the answer was nothing, he would tell her to think about something else. Julie didn't see any of it that way. It wasn't as if she chose to be like she was. Who in their right mind would choose to live such a dark and lonely life? That should have been a signal to somebody that something was terribly wrong. Everyone did notice, except Julie. She wasn't aware that anything was wrong or different in her at any particular time. She thought she was normal, but just having periods of moodiness. 
everyone but Julie understood that she had, in fact, a depressive disorder of some kind. She didn't know anyone else suffered the same way she did, or even that it was an illness and not just a bad mood. Julie only knew that her mind controlled how she thought, felt, and acted. She didn't know that what she was dealing with was a treatable mental health disorder. She was completely unaware that her feelings of sadness and loss of interest in her family and friends or activities she once enjoyed wasn't going to be with her forever. Despondently, Julie had been planning on this visit to the Intercontinental Hotel in Miami for months, with a permanent solution in mind for what was a temporary problem. The last time I used the words, I can't do this anymore, was when I was about to throw away our marriage. I had already contacted a divorce attorney, and I had run numbers through my head a thousand times, trying to reassure myself that I could survive on my own. I was worried only that you would be cruel and nasty in the divorce because when we fought, you were cruel and nasty. You would take on a persona that scared me, and I had seen your ugly side too many times. I wasn't going to kill myself then. I just wanted to get away from Morty. What stopped me was something a former boss of mine had once said to me, and that was, murder, yes, divorce, no. Julie fell back against the pillows yet again. The thought of her old boss made her smile. Nora had been a strength to her in so many ways. She didn't just steal Julie at the time her marriage was rocky, but Nora had given her new perspectives about a lot of things over the years. As she laid back against the pillows this time, she noticed her own stench. She decided that maybe she should take a shower after all. Sitting back up, Julie saved her work and turned off the laptop. Cautiously, she moved it to the side of the bed and tried to stretch her legs out. Her knees were stiff and cracking. She had no idea what time it was or even what day. She had been sitting like that for hours, pecking away at her old work-issued computer. It was obsolete, so they let her keep it when she walked away from the station. At one point, she had worried that they would be able to track her location with it, so she disabled the internet and location apps, and by so doing, she figured she would be okay. You can't even run away from home in peace these days with this frickin' technology. When she attempted to stretch out and swing her legs over the side of the bed, she laughed to herself and wondered how she would ever climb out on the ledge if she can't even climb off the bed. Her body had begun to defy her a long time ago. She had started sprouting a few gray hairs in her early 30s, but she accepted this as genetics. Her dad had gone completely white by the time he was 40. What she was having trouble getting used to was being exhausted all the time. Ever since she went through the change, her energy level has been uncharacteristically low. And now, if she sits in one place for more than a few minutes, she creaks like the Tin Man. Gradually making her way to the luxurious bathroom, Julie disrobed, dropping one article of clothing with each step. She found herself reflecting on the thousands of times she must have reprimanded Allie and Sophie for doing the same thing. They were such slobs. They never put anything away when they were finished with it. The piles of clothes on the floor of their rooms probably had three or four layers to them. And you know what? So what? What was the big deal? The clothes eventually made it into the laundry, and both of my girls keep beautiful homes now. Oh well, maybe at the time I thought that was good parenting. It took a while for the hot water to make it up to the higher floors, even in luxury hotels. Julie didn't mind waiting, there was no rush. Some of her ramblings in her suicide note had started her thinking that maybe she had a bit more to write. There were some things she hadn't said yet, some unfinished business. She reminded herself that her daughters had come a long way over the years, but maybe they would need her when they started their own families. Maybe not. Maybe I hadn't done such a great job with my own life, so who am I to give guidance? They are way more well-adjusted than I am. Julie's older daughter had always been very pliable and easy. She did what she was told and never really had to be punished or reprimanded. Even as a teenager, Allie wasn't too difficult. She dated nice boys who didn't make Morty feel threatened. He would joke that he didn't feel the need to chase them away with a baseball bat. Allie had been an excellent student, was active in a lot of school activities, lettered in two sports, and yet still she was a homebody. 
All the kids gathered at her house, which thrilled Julie and Morty as they were able to keep an eye on them. They even had to force her to go on the class trips to various places around the country. Allie was prone to separation anxiety since she was a baby. I had to peel her off me when she was in daycare and preschool. And it wasn't just the first day. It was like that every day for three fucking years. The funny part is she was so easygoing and friendly, I never understood where all that shit came from. Sophie, on the other hand, couldn't wait to get loose. She was more of a challenge from the beginning. She let go of Morty's hand when he dropped her at daycare and never looked back. She was always more adventurous and is, to this day, more well-traveled than both of her parents put together. She made friends wherever she went and knew people on almost every continent. She explored every avenue available to her, and while Julie and Morty wanted her to be more like her sister and bring her friends home, they were a bit intimidated by some of the characters with whom she was associating. They were grateful when she finally settled down and got married, finding love and a career right in Florida. Julie leaned against the marble walls, cheating her arm behind the shower curtain to check the water temperature. She felt a chill. The water can't be taking this long. Maybe I'm a little hungry or dehydrated too, she thought. As the goose flesh became more prominent, Julie took a deep breath. Bunching her shoulders up to prepare for the shock, she pushed the curtain aside and then swung one leg over the oversized tub side. Placing her foot down, she realized the water was just right. She hastily stepped in all the way and positioned herself directly under the shower head. Hmm, that feels good. I forgot how much I love a hot shower. What has it been, two or three days since I've done this? Or was it only yesterday? She turned around and glanced at the soap dish. While it wasn't wet, it appeared to have been used. Fine hotels always have obscure brands of shampoo and conditioner, soaps, and all kinds of other things for hoity-toity people to perform their daily ablutions. Just give me my pert and I'm fine. Oh, but this does feel good. Julie let the water run over her head. She stood there under the steamy cascades, her mind wandering back to the days when the kids were still home. She used to love her time in the bathroom. When everyone else had finished showering, when the laundry was done, and when the dishwasher had finished the wash cycle, she would sneak back to her sanctuary, as she called it, and soak in the tub for an hour. She would then let the water run out, stand up, and turn on the shower. She would scrub with a scented body wash, primp, and go through all kinds of cleanliness and beauty rituals. That was a long time ago. But what's the point now? I don't have to wrestle with the girls for bathroom time or hot water. Morty barely looks at me now anyway. He's barely ever home. Talk about an empty nest. That house is so quiet all the time. Maybe having a bunch of high schoolers, wacky or not, was better than the eerie silence. Sometimes the echo from the sound of my slippers sloughing along the marble floors towards the kitchen for a glass of wine while waiting for Morty to get home is the only sound in the whole damn house for the whole damn day. She glanced down at herself again. I guess I could take a little better care of myself. I don't remember the last time I bought any new clothes. Everything is stained or torn, except a couple of decent suits I was wearing to work. But now that I've been replaced, I guess that doesn't fucking matter anymore. My shoes, even my good ones, are scuffed. I don't think we even have any polish in the house anymore. It's one thing Morty used to do for me that he doesn't do anymore. Polish my shoes. He used to bring me coffee in bed in the morning. He used to stop and bring me flowers or chocolate on the way home from the hospital. I used to catch him watching me get dressed. Oh well, it's not going to matter anymore now. Julie's stream of consciousness was interrupted by the phone ringing in the bedroom. Nobody knew she was there, so she assumed it was the desk or housekeeping again. She let the phone continue to ring, forcing them to leave a message, since she was still dripping wet. She stood totally naked in front of the steamed-up mirror in the bathroom. She couldn't look at herself in the eye. However, she had no problem being critical of every inch of the rest of her body. She had gained over 80 pounds since she first walked down the aisle to marry Morty almost 35 years ago. She had stopped coloring her hair six months ago, leaving it totally gray and lifeless. She now tells everyone she is a purist and refuses to color her hair. That's just an excuse. 
The real reason was that she had heard that hair dye caused cancer, and Julie was always worried about her health. Julie didn't know why she wasn't more concerned with her appearance. She found herself constantly judging all the other women her age for their liposuction, their Botox, their endless trips to the doctor for yet another cosmetic surgery procedure. They spent thousands on their makeup, gym memberships, and wardrobes. For what? To be ignored by their husbands? Nope. No plastic surgery. No hair color. No need for gobs of makeup. I was supposed to be fine with the way God made me. If it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. And it better be good enough for everyone else. And if Morty thinks I'm not sexy enough for him anymore, then that's his problem. Besides, our marriage shouldn't be based wholly on our sex life and my appearance. At least not anymore. It should be much more intimate than that by now. I know sex is important, but if that's how he thinks, then I don't want to be with him anyway. He needs to understand that women change a lot when they get to be my age. After menopause, they lose their svelte bodies, and with that, a great deal of their libido. I love him more today than the day I married him, and I show it in myriad ways. I'm just not interested in sex. I mean, for God's sakes, it hurts to do it. It could be the drop in my hormones, my low self-image, my medications, or all three. She noticed that her body was nearly dry, yet she hadn't picked up a towel, not realizing that she had been standing there for 10 minutes fighting with her husband. The mirror was only damp, and she could now fully see herself. You know what? I need to add this question and talk about this in my suicide note or letter or whatever the hell I'm writing. This next question would be why men equate sex with love. I mean, why does Morty feel I don't love him just because I'm not as interested in sex as I used to be? Let me go get this down. I do love him. I do. I'm just not interested in making love. Julie grabbed the robe from the hook on the back of the door. Shoving her arms through the sleeves, she realized that she had left the sleeves inside out the last time she used the robe. Pausing and listening to herself think, she tried desperately to remember the last time she showered. She patted the pockets of what was once a plush white terry robe, packed neatly in a thick plastic bag. Her heart skipped a beat. Her cigarette pack was in there. Did I use the robe yesterday? Did I shower yesterday? When did I go outside to smoke last? Frozen, Julie began rocking back and forth, trying to remember the events that led up to her hanging the robe in the bathroom with her cigarette still in the pocket. The robe still smelled of smoke. This was that same panicky feeling she seemed to be getting more and more often. She couldn't even remember the last time she ate anything or even how long she had been at the hotel. The mirror was completely dry, as was her hair. She tried to focus in on her face, but without her glasses, she could barely make out the fact that her complexion was pale, her lips gray. She backed up and found her way to the side of the tub and sat on the edge, holding on with both hands. She shook her head like a dog would after coming in from the rain, as if to evoke a memory or two. Oh shit, here I go again. Not realizing how lightheaded she was, that little shake knocked her off balance and Julie fell backwards into the tub. She couldn't hold on to interrupt the fall. All she could think of to do was to avoid hitting her head, so straining her neck forward, she landed on her left shoulder, the rest of her body slinking and sliding in after. Phew, that was close. Funny though, if I had just hit my head, it could have all been over. I guess that survival instinct that lives within all of us kicks in unless we are being single-minded of purpose. I mean, I didn't plan to do it that way, so I saved myself. Hmm, graceful. Maybe I just wasn't supposed to die today. Maybe there is still some sense of self-preservation deep down inside me. Julie pulled her legs back over the side and into the tub so that she could gather herself and stand up and climb out like a lady, as if she were being watched. It was a strange sensation, one she hadn't felt in a long time. It was as if she was on show. She tried awkwardly to cover her naked body with the robe. Julie had played so many roles in her lifetime, but now she had concluded that she had none left to play. She was no longer a full-time mom, nor a full-time employee, nor a full-time wife, if a wife at all. Hell, even her mother had more on her schedule than she did. Nobody needed her anymore. 
She was relatively sure nobody wanted her either. She pulled the ties of the robe and loosely tied them together. I just have this great big pity party to which I must go. That's all. This is not so out of the ordinary. Oh, wait, now I remember. I had this thing on over my bathing suit when I was checking out the logistics. The damn rooftop pool is only on the fifth floor. Fifth floor isn't going to be high enough. I took the smokes with me so I could have a cigarette outside without having to sneak out a side door. Don't want anyone to recognize me. I'm sure by now there's a missing persons report out and my picture has been circulated. Still can't remember how long I've been here. Floppy hats, sunglasses, and bathrobes poolside is not too suspicious. But that wasn't today. It wasn't even yesterday. Wait, what time is it? Julie returned to the bedroom, put her glasses on, and looked at the digital clock at the bedside. 3.15. She then saw the light blinking on the phone. She worried for just an instant that she had been discovered. Blowing the fear off, she dialed the automated message system. Relieved to find they were only concerned that she hadn't had housekeeping in for the three days, she called and asked them to send someone up in about a half hour. I'll just leave the room and take a walk down to the pool for a smoke with my disguise. Throwing a bathing suit and the robe on, Julie made a manual note of her shower epiphany, fully anticipating dealing with it in her letter when she came back upstairs. Morty should learn from this, but she was not going to be objectified as a woman anymore. He and his cronies with their trophy wives and their artificial bodies can go fuck themselves. At least Morty hadn't asked for a divorce. Yet. Wait, why do I keep doing that? It's not like it's going to matter tomorrow. I wonder why I keep going back to acting like I'm teaching Morty a lesson. I'm not checking out because I'm angry at Morty or because I want to teach him a lesson. I just hurt inside. I just feel like I don't want to compete with those other women anymore. Or am I the only one competing? Who is competing with me? Does anyone care? Julie grabbed the gray floppy hat that she had gotten at Allie's bridal shower. Her friend Natalie was so creative, having an afternoon tea and having all the ladies dress up. They had all gotten the floppy hats as party favors and played such cute games. It was nice for once to go to one of these things that wasn't all about male strippers and sex or having to reveal deep, dark secrets. Julie paused for a moment. If my daughters knew some of my secrets, I wonder if they would have understood me better. I wonder if they would have had a little Rachmanis or empathy for me. I know they would comprehend better some of the reasons I reacted the way I did to some of the things they went through. Jilted out of her thoughts when there was a loud rapping on the door, Julie sat back on the bed. What part of half an hour didn't they understand, Julie spoke aloud, as she grabbed her sunglasses from the nightstand and hastily maneuvered them onto her face with one hand and smashed the hat over her hair with the other. How keeping? Just a minute, Julie was immediately relieved. How keeping? She decided that since that was a Spanish accent, the lady wouldn't recognize her anyway. She got up from the bed, picked up her beach bag, and slipped her laptop into the main section. She walked over to the door and unlocked all the extra security locks to let in the maid. I'll be at the pool for a little while, Julie breezed past the maid. Yes, Mrs. Yes, Mrs. So now there's another question. If I feel so misunderstood by the people that are close to me, to the point that I end up here, like this, how come this little Spanish lady somehow makes me feel important? All she did was refer to me politely by calling me Mrs. That's her job, I know. Maybe she doesn't want to get in any trouble. Maybe she's one of those illegals. Now I know what the question was that I wanted to write down. The question is, did I? Julie pushed the button on the inside of the elevator, grateful that she was alone, knowing full well that she would remember about the question and blurt it out loud. Oh yeah! She even startled herself. The whole point of this was to answer the question of whether your whole life passes before your eyes right before you die. That's where I left off. I guess I'll find the answer out tonight. Or maybe tomorrow night. <laughs>